you, folks. I, uh, I appreciate you all coming out early this morning. My name's Eric Silfen. I'm an emergency physician, and I'm going to tell you a bit of a story about having heart. So let's take a look. This is the heart, quite miraculous, right? Beating, pumping blood, really the, the force that drives everything that we do. So the heart can symbolize uh, goodwill. It can be functional. It can symbolize romance. Um, but at the end of the day, the heart is a pump. It's really a, quite a miraculous pump. No amount of technology that we're able to create can match this device that, on average, for as long as we live, will pump 72 times a minute. It's pretty good, considering all of the technology and such that we have available at, at our disposal. So um, we live probably on average 78, 79 years, and our heart has to keep pumping for all that period of time. So no Maytag whoosh whoosh washing machine is certainly going to be able to do that kind of work for 78 years continuously. So given that we are born without any congenital heart-related problems, we have a wickedly efficient, beautifully pristine cardiovascular system. But unfortunately, we can screw it up. And I've been in the practice of medicine for my entire career. And I have had to take care of folks for whom this was a problem. However, we know that if we exercise, if we take good care of ourselves, if we eat right, if we sleep right, um, we can possibly avoid significant complications. But even then, we could end up on the wrong side of a stent uh, based upon our genetic makeup. So I work in, in, a, in a technology company right now. I no longer practice emergency medicine. So I work in the world of looking inside the body, looking inside the vessels, looking inside the heart, trying to illuminate what's right and wrong, creating the ability to guide and intervene to save lives. So I came here to San Diego to tell you a little bit about this work. Uh, now this picture here is not to talk just about what the best place to put your automatic external defibrillator so that anyone can find it when they need it. It's a picture of a Coke machine in Japan. And obviously, if you know where the Coke machine is, you will also know where the AED is if you happen to need it. But more importantly, I want to talk about what it takes for human inspiration, human creativity, to make the incongruous understandable, to solve complex medical problems, and to enable better medical care. So let's take a little bit of a deeper look. Let's take a look at a video.
You can, you can all thank Alexander for that. Um, you, can also thank, you can also thank all of the folks who contributed on that uh, in telling their stories. But what you can see is it's one, one heart, born pristine, two separate paths. But that's not all there is to the story. Can we go back one slide, please? So that's me, three years old. Every Jewish mother's dream. <laughs> My son, the doctor, right? And not out of any greater calling for you know, social good, just because my mother wanted me to always have a respectable job. So I went on to college. I took very good care of myself. I ate well, didn't smoke cigarettes, had my granola, had my veggies, was a top flight, if not a bit avant-garde tennis player. Went on to medical school. I did all the right stuff. But one day, 15 years ago, I was working in the emergency department. I'd just gotten back from a fishing trip. Favorite place. This is Long Island in the Bahamas. Bone fishing. Really cool. Uh, and I was working, and a little birdie was whispering in my ear. And it wasn't Polly want a cracker. You remember, thir every year, 33,000 babies are born with congenital heart problems. So I wasn't feeling quite right. And I asked a friend of mine who was a cardiologist to uh, come down, take a look at me. So he examined me, listened, he listened to my heart. He put the stethoscope in my ears and said to me, can you hear this sound? We could play the sound, please. That whoosh, whoosh, Maytag sound was a faulty mitral heart valve. Congenital. I was one of the 33,000 babies born with a problem. So I had top-notch uh, diagnostic cardiologist take care of me at Reston Hospital Center, a top-notch cardiac surgeon take care of me at Cleveland Clinic, and a top-notch interventional cardiologist care for me at Lenox Hill Hospital in New York City. All of the talent, technology, pills of all kinds of colors, including white, which work. Uh, and I'm doing fine, and all I have left to show is a scar down the center of my chest. But let's flash forward 15, 15 years. Mitral valve repair surgery is very, very different. Places you can go, you don't have to have your chest cracked open. You don't have to go on a heart-lung machine. And you don't have to have prolonged anesthesia. So here you'll see a picture of a mitral valve, 3D ultrasound, preoperative picture, followed by a picture of a mitral valve repair. And you can see there's no longer a deficit, no longer a hole, right? Done. All with the advances of, of imaging technology that didn't exist and the ability to do minimally invasive surgery. Fantastic. But there's more to the story. This is Anita. Anita is 16 years old, and Anita has a defective aortic valve. At her age, it's not possible, or it hadn't been possible, to uh, do valve repair. So she would have needed a valve replacement. That valve replacement would have required a mechanical valve with all of its intended complications of failure, infection, and the need to be on long-term anticoagulant medication. But now, with the advances of uh, sophisticated preoperative planning using 3D imaging planning tools and intraoperative guidance using sophisticated imaging techniques, we can actually take tissue from around the heart, from the pericardium, appropriately reconstruct the valve, ending up with a much better clinical outcome, fewer complications, no need to be on any anticoagulant medication, 
and a valve that'll last a lifetime. Quite amazing. So here you see just a picture of an aortic valve, and you can see the hole in the center that needed to be fixed. Followed by a picture post-operatively of a valve, and you see how it closes completely. Absolutely fascinating. All done because of advances in clinical imaging and minimally invasive surgery. So what's next? Let's go back in time from 44 years to 16 years to an unborn baby. We can perform surgery on unborn fetuses weeks before they're born. What would be significant traumatic surgery that would have to be performed after birth, which would lead to significant complications, can be avoided, all because of our ability to perform interventions in a, in a timely fashion with a minimal amount of, of trauma. So this is where I work. In, in a world of technology that looks at blood vessels, looks inside the body, looks inside the heart, illuminates what's right and wrong, and provides the ability to intervene early on and save lives. But it's not the end of the story. What we have done now provides us with new challenges and new responsibilities. Illuminating and intervening has demanded that we as physicians provide the necessary follow-up, monitoring, and long-term and long-term outpatient care, right? Just because we can perform heart surgery that is very precise, very accurate, in a minimally invasive fashion, it does not mean that there was not a significant insult to the body. And it does not mean that it is unimportant to provide the types of continual monitoring that's necessary to allow people to recover. Just because there's not a scar on your chest, that doesn't mean that the significant change didn't occur inside. And it's going to be our responsibility as physicians to afford patients with a strong and invisible tether that will give them peace of mind and complete the cycle of care. So that not only are we going to improve medicine with our minds, but we're going to improve medicine with our hearts. We're going to take on the full responsibility. And in that way, we will end up practicing respectable medicine. And then my mother will be proud of me and will be proud of the rest of us. So what is the future going to bring for us? Well, my feeling is that it will firmly land on the visual integration of what takes place in the biochemical and genetic world when married to what we can see in terms of physical findings and physiological information. This merging, if you will, of what we can illuminate from the inside and out of, of how we will be able to intervene in unimaginable ways without the heart missing a beat is what's going to change the practice of medicine as we know it today. So in closing, uh, yeah, science is really marvelous, but I would suggest that uh, follow Martha's advice and eat your veggies. I would say that you uh, wear your direct life and exercise. And so keep healthy and uh, a big event. Thank you. Tell them they think you can pick it up, one of those things at your booth, right? Yes. Can't well, tell them. Yes. The, the, um, the direct life that I alluded to here is available at the, uh, at the, at the Phillips booth. Uh, it is a sophisticated accelerometer that will allow you to not only um, measure your daily activity, but to correlate it with your caloric burn, 
So uh, for those of you who are type A and, and above, it is an excellent reminder to, uh, you know, to keep exercising. And uh, got to tell you, it, it's, a, it's a worthwhile device. So again, thank you all. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.